uh, with um, uh, each shape and how how we plan for it to take shape uh, as also the dignitaries today on the panel uh, kindly introduce all of them yeah. uh, to the audience uh, stage is yours dr meshram please yeah uh, thank you dr gagandeep dear friends good morning good afternoon good evening buenas dias bonjour on behalf of tropical and geographical neurology speciality group of world federation of neurology and indian academy of neurology i welcome you all for this new series inspiring people in neurosciences this once a month series will be held on first saturday of the month after the hugely successful educational neuro infection series 1 and 2 with very interesting 16 sessions we are back again with this exciting series in this series we will learn about legends we have done great work in the field of neurosciences the idea is to ignite young minds to do outstanding work in the field of their choice in this series there will be heart to heart talk brain to brain talk mind to mind talk it is once in a lifetime opportunity so we will feel it experience it and get immersed in it world neglected tropical diseases day was on 29th january it is very apt to have professor david molinu as inspirational person for today's session warm welcome professor david molinu to inaugurate this series we are fortunate to have professor wolfgang grisol general secretary of world federation of neurology he is a neurologist at the beautiful city of vienna in austria he is a member of austrian society of neurology european academy of neurology american academy of neurology peripheral nerve society society of neuro oncology european association of neuro oncology his areas of interest is education apart from neuro oncology neuromuscular diseases palliative care advocacy and history of neurology he has more than 250 publications and several books he is an excellent organizer and we all remember the wonderful world congress he organized in vienna in 2013 he has attended most of the previous sessions on neuro infections welcome professor viso president of wfn professor william carroll could not join for today's session due to other commitments but he was very kind to send a video message we we will see shortly later to chair this first session we have professor raj shakir who is immediate past president of world federation of neurology he is professor of neurology at uh, imperial college london he was named as commander of the british empire on queen's new year honors list this year for his services to global neurology it is a coincidence that professor david molinu received the honor last year professor rad is chair of neurosciences topic advisory group of world health organization is president of south of england neurological association is chair of speciality groups of world federation of neurology and chair of our committee of ean he was previously chair of tropical neurology research group and tropical neurology is close to his heart he is a driving and guiding force for this speciality 
He has also authored two books on tropical neurology, and he's co-editor of special supplement on tropical neurology of JNS. He's author of 80 uh, publications in journals and participated in, I must uh, mention that he has participated in all the 16 previous sessions on neuroinfections. For today's session, we have eminent invited panelists. Lorenzo Savioli is a senior United Nations civil servant and the director of Department of Control of Neglected Tropical Diseases at World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Professor Alan Fenwick is director of the Cystosomiasis Control Initiative and professor of tropical parasitology at Imperial College London, UK. Professor Peter Hotez is the Dean, National School of Tropical Medicine, Houston, and Professor, Department of Pediatrics, Molecular Biology and Microbiology. is co-head section of Pediatric Tropical Medicine. He's a co-director, Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development. We also have Simon Bush, is a director of neglected tropical diseases at Site Savers. He has more than 35 years of development experience in Africa and in Middle East, with 19 years in leadership role for NTD programs. We also have Professor Jerk Yudzinger, who is the director of Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute and professor of epidemiology at the University of Basel. And uh, Dr. Kiran Thakur is Assistant Professor, Department of Neurology, Columbia University, College of Physicians and Surgeons, New York. I would uh, extend warm welcome to all the panelists. In the room, we have uh, Professor J.M.K. Murdi, who is the President of Indian Academy of Neurology. Uh, we also have uh, Professor uh, Steve Lewis, who is WFN trustee. I welcome to Professor Murthy and uh, uh, Professor Steve Lewis. I would also like to welcome Professor uh, Gagandeep Singh, who is uh, the former secretary of Indian Academy of Neurology. And uh, uh, I now request uh, Professor Wilfang Grisol to do the inaugural session. I am sure that uh, you are going to enjoy, everyone is going to enjoy this particular series. And uh, I would like to receive your feedbacks because uh, we don't want to do what we think we should do, but we want to do what you think we should do for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mishran, and thank you for this beautiful organization of all this series. I want to say my greetings to you, all of you, to have the proper address for all the time zones. And I want to welcome you on behalf of the WFN for this new initiative of the speciality group of tropical neurology and the Indian Academy of Neurology. My name is Dr. Wolfgang Grisold, and I'm the Secretary General of the World Federation. And I'm very honored and pleased to be able to hold the inauguration of this meeting, which will be a new series following these successful series on tropical neurology. The aim of this series is to introduce inspiring persons who by their commitment and research gave important impulses into neurology. As you know, everything is Latin. So I went back to the etymology and inspire, inspirating means inhale. And it's usually meant in artistic sense, in religious sense, in art and in creative sense. And it needs also expiring. And the hope is that once we have received the inspirational talk, we will also expirate or exhale to our fellow colleagues and to our co-workers. There will be a meeting that will be interactive after the main talk and after the plenary session and there will be blogs and interactions with the faculty and um, as 
I must say, in these times of COVID that we are facing now without congresses and without person-to-person -person meetings, this new series was very timely and marked a new step in communication and education. And uh, the improving technology has enabled us to manage some of the hurdles of the pandemic. Please also note, and it has been mentioned by Meshram before, that there will be also a special issue on neuroinfections, uh, which will be published in our journal, which is the Journal of Neurologic Sciences, and it will be edited by Professor Shakir, John England, Marco Medina, and Professor Meshram, and it will be soon announced. It will have interesting topics, and I just copied down the content that it will have uh, HIV, rabies, leprosy, tuberculosis, neuroprocellosis, and many other topics that you might be able to watch on YouTube uh, if you look at the previous series. I just want to briefly mention the World Federation. We have 122 members presently, and we are invited to follow our activities on the website or on the publications. And we have, as I mentioned before, the Journal of Neurologic Sciences. We have a smaller journal, which is called E-Neurologic Sciences and has a new editor, Professor Struhal, who tries to encourage and expand the width of this journal. And we have World Neurology, which is done by Professor Stephen Lewis and is a wonderful source of activities. This year, the World Congress of Neurology is planned for Rome in October, and we're still hoping that the circumstances will allow a hybrid meeting, but we are, of course, dependent on circumstances. Please note that the World Federation at present also has several activities as a membership update, a needs registry, and we would like your societies to participate. And, and uh, I will ask Measure now for, to, to replace my slide with a banner of the World Brain Health Initiative. We also have the Brain Health Initiative involving the, all the regions of the world to advocate for brain health. And you will find the banner on and the toolbox on the websites. There will be five topics. What happens if the brain is unhealthy? How to improve? What economic impact it has? And finally, what can neurologists do to advocate for brain, for brain health? You can find this on the website and also some uh, toolbox with print material. And please circulate also to your colleagues about this important series and about the possibility to look at it. With that, I end and I wish us all an inspiring sessions, personal health and resilience facing the pandemic and successful exploration to promote further inspirations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gisal, for that uh, wonderful address and uh, inaugurating the series. Uh, Professor uh, William Carroll, WFN president, could not join, but he has sent a video message. Uh, Mansi, can we run the video, please? Yes, sir. Hello. I'm most grateful to Professor Chandrasekhar Meshram for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Professor Meshram is, as you know, chairman of the Tropical Geograph and Geographical Neurology Specialty Group of the World Federation of Neurology. He and his team are launching a new educational series. This follows the very successful series on neuroinfections held last year. The new series will comprise a monthly uh, session dealing with inspiration. Inspiration is a really valuable commodity and attribute. The series is based on inspirational speakers talking about inspirational figures in neurology and neuroscience from the 20th century. Most of them have areas of specific recognition. All of their significant contributions were based on clinical neurology or emerging science and inspired many. As I'm unable to join the session this evening myself, 
I wish all concerned a most successful, informative and enjoyable session today and through the series. Thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful address from message from Professor William Carroll. We also have uh, Indian Academy of Neurology President, uh, Professor J.M. Kimurti. And uh, I request Professor J.M. Kimurti to say a few words. On behalf of uh, Indian Academy of Neurology, I welcome all of you to this wonderful uh, meeting. I should say this is a very novel idea taken up by Dr. Mashram. I will, uh, we will be the legends about whom they are going to talk will be their history, their life will inspire us. I wish the function all the success. Thank you, uh, Professor Murthy. Uh, now I hand over to Professor Raj Shakir to carry on with further proceedings. Professor Raj. Thank you very much. Uh, well, this is a new series about inspiration, inspirational individuals who have, um, in many ways, um, led us the way of in, in our specialty. And also, although Professor David Molyneux is a parasitologist and a world leader in parasitology, but he is uh, the leader for the neglected tropical diseases topic, which has gained a lot of momentum over the last two decades. So if I can have the first slide. Now, Professor Molyneux, can we have the slide, please? Thank you. Professor Molyneux is an Emeritus Professor in the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and Emeritus Professor at the University of Liverpool. Excellent. I've highlighted the important issues which I would like to draw your attention to, but the whole bio will be available uh, later on in um, on uh, when when you look at YouTube. Um, he was honored in 2020 New Year's Honors List with the Companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, CMG, for services to controlling neglected tropical diseases. And it's very, very apt that now we are going to talk today about neglected tropical diseases. And there is no one better to talk to us about this than David Molyneux. He's the director of the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine uh, for 10 years and professor of tropical health sciences at the university. Um, he is Dean of Science at the University of Salford and Professor Molyneux graduated from Cambridge University uh, in parasitology before embarking on a career in parasitology and entomology. Next slide, thank you. His research work um, has been recognized with the award of DSC from the University of Salford in 1992. Um, his major interest is trypanosomiasis uh, and leishmaniasis. And over the, uh, the last two decades, he became involved in parasitic and vector-borne disease control programs, advising the WHO on all these topics. As you can see, trypanosomiasis, oncocerciasis, lymphatic filariasis, malaria control. He supervised many, many PhD and master students and uh, his initiatives uh, on and the impact of that on, on impact on climate change, on the distribution of vector insect-borne diseases. I will move on to the next slide. Thank you. He, he has over 400 publications, 25 reviews, contribution to books. And he was the editor of a Lancet series on neglected tropical diseases in 2010, and was the lead author and an invited follow-up author in the Lancet review in 2016. And he uh, coined the concept of chronic pandemic, which I'm sure he will talk about or mention today. Um, very interesting to our audience and to all of us, he's the editor of an online series of some 35 lectures 
on neglected tropical diseases. And it's a huge trove for anybody interested to go to YouTube and watch these lectures. Um, his publications are many, and uh, he is a consultant to many organizations. And as you can see in bold, from WHO to FAO to United Nations and to the World Bank and UK government. He has chaired several WHO committees on onchocerciasis, sleeping sickness, filariasis, capacity strengthening, strengthening and diseases, diseases and mosquitoes. Next slide, please. He's a member of expert panels on parasitic diseases, and I will not go through all the details which are available to you later on, but he was executive secretary of the Global Alliance for the Elimination of Lymphatic Filariasis between 2006 and 2010. And the program has provided uh, since 2000, the current center in Liverpool and they started nearly with a billion treatments. I'm sure the neglected tropical diseases and the London Declaration will be mentioned by Professor uh, Molyneux in his talk to us today. Next slide, please. Next. He has had many recognitions and medals, and they are highlighted in front of you. The Manson's Medal, the Chalmers Medal, the Christopher Wright Medal, Mackay Medal, the Dominique Calum Prize, and recently the Mary Kingsley Medal, of the University of, Liverpool, uh, Liber Liber of Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. He's a, an international lecturer, plenary lecturer, and goes all around the world addressing audiences in the topic of what's, the, what's been called, and I think correctly, the bottom billion of, the, of humanity. Next slide, please. Next. Now, he has been made Doctor of Science, Georgetown University, and Honorary Fellow of Liverpool Jones Moore University. And uh, I just highlighted the last three lines. He has been one of the key advocates in raising the profile of neglected tropical diseases to the extent that they are now one of the priorities of the World Health Organization and a target of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There's nobody who is more qualified to talk to us about neglected tropical diseases in the topic of today than Professor Molyneux. So I invite Professor Molyneux to address the gathering with our gratitude. Thank you very much, Professor Molyneux. Okay, can you hear me? I think that's the first thing to say. And uh, I yeah. intend to share the screen. Okay, Dr. Mezran, is that okay? I'm going to put the screen yeah. share on. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'm enormously flattered by your remarks, uh, Professor Shakir. But I want to start by saying that um, I'm extremely privileged to be able to give this lecture to so many neurologists. I think I must start by saying I'm not clinically qualified. Maybe that's been an advantage in my career, but at the same time, I want to first of all say that I think I speak on behalf of a community of colleagues, friends who've been on this journey for the last 20 years or so. Um, and I'm delighted that uh, some of them have been able to join us and Alan Fennick, Jürgen Singer, Simon Bush, Peter Hotez, and Lorenzo Savioli have been absolutely key to where we are now. So I don't want to be seen to take credit where it is inappropriate because this has really been a team effort which has moved over a period of nearly 20 years from a, a concept to a key aspect of global health policy. So I'm going to start by just emphasizing that the title was deliberately chosen to emphasize the fact that what we have is the emergence of an anti-poverty global health brand. And whilst we are as 
people involved with individual diseases looking at those diseases from a patient perspective. Uh, we are also talking about what I believe is an important aspect of the international development agenda. And I want to start by showing this slide which we created to emphasize a slight frustration at the beginning of this journey when there was so much emphasis on HIV, TB and malaria. And it represents two aliens approaching planet Earth being under the impression from what they'd read that there are only three diseases on the planet. And I think that was a gross misrepresentation of the real situation when we started to think about neglected tropical diseases and the fact that they actually affected nearly two billion people. And that was where we started to think about how we could raise the attention of the global health community and policymakers to these diseases, which I'm just going to show you now, represent some of the problems that we're up against. And I'll be talking about some of these diseases. And as clinicians, you'll probably be familiar with them. On the left, there is the symptoms of lymphatic filariasis, lymphedema, and hydrocele. And on the right of the slide in the center, there are blind individuals from river blindness. And the central picture is actually quite interesting because it's a blind man trying to work in a village called Ajubendi in Ghana, emphasizing the fact that even the blind are expected to contribute to society. Uh, and um, these pictures were shown and taken in the 1970s and 80s, and they represent the reality of the time, but now things have moved on. And a few skin diseases, some of which you'd be familiar with, Beruli ulcer, uh, chronic leishmaniasis, uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis, and on the bottom right, uh, a spondia from South America, a, a eroding infection of the uh, nasopharynx. Um, and sleeping sickness, which I'll talk a little bit about, uh, a patient, uh, somebody being taken to a health facility in Chad, which was closed when the patient arrived. They were moved on to the hospital, which was also closed. Uh, so we are seeing, when we look at these diseases, some of the inadequacies of resource constrained, constrained health systems. The bottom left is a picture of trypanosomes. And some of the diseases I'm talking about are, are not endemic in, in India. Sleeping sickness is not endemic in India. River blindness is not endemic in India. Uh, and um, neither is schistosomiasis. Um, so in many ways, India has been fortunate to avoid these afflictions. But the bottom left picture is the hand-drawn photograph of trypanosomes drawn by Joseph Dutton, who discovered sleeping sickness in the Gambia in a patient in 1905, four or five. Um, who later died on a Liverpool school expedition to what is now DRC a year or two later. Now, this slide really was when I was first exposed to the problems of river blindness, and it was taken by a colleague of the gentleman, the white gentleman, uh, colleague David Baldry, uh, in Burkina Faso in 1974. And he's talking to males from a village not far from the capital, Ouagadougou, None of the Africans there in the photograph are fully sighted. Most of them are irreversibly blind. That was the situation of river blindness in West Africa uh, prior to the operations of the River Blindness Control Program, uh, which started in 1974. So what are NTDs in terms of their overall stature and status? They're a proxy for disadvantage and poverty. They affect the populations with the lowest vi visibility and no political voice. They are stigmatizing, they cause discrimination, disability, associated with social isolation, and there is a significant impact on mental health of those who are affected. And there, in terms of what the global burden of disease says, they are significantly underestimated in terms of morbidity and mortality. And in comparison with, let's say, the big three diseases or some of the non-communicable diseases, they are relatively neglected by research. But what stimulated us was they can be controlled, eliminated, and possibly even eradicated. Now, the list of neglected tropical diseases that WHO identify as those diseases are listed here. Don't worry too much about them. 
we started when there were only 20, uh, sorry, 13 diseases, but there are now 20 categorized by WHO as in neglected tropical diseases. <clears throat> and there are diversity of causative organisms, but they have the common features which were exemplified in the last slide. Now, Dr. Shakir referred to chronic pandemic, and I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. But in a paper in 2004, I identified the fact that control of these diseases and elimination of public health problems with these diseases had already been achieved. In China, lymphatic filariasis had been controlled in a population of 350 million people. River blindness as a public health problem was largely under control in West Africa. Guinea worm had made significant progress up to that time and is now confined to five countries rather than four on the slide. There have been successes in trachoma in uh, Morocco and Oman, and that has been extended recently to other countries. Leprosy uh, with the av availability of multi-drug therapy uh, had gone down significantly in terms of presidents, pre prevalence. In South America, Chagas disease, another of the trypanosome diseases, had been controlled by indo indoor residual spraying uh, of urban houses. Uh, and there'd been significant progress in soil transmitted elements and schistosomiasis control in Egypt and China. And as a result of contacts with Richard Horton at the Lancet, who's been a great supporter of NTDs, as Dr. Shakir said, we've had a series in the Lancet and stayed in touch with Richard Horton, who's been a great supporter. And the paper he referred to in 2016 is, is highlighted there. Um, but I wanted to mention what India has done, despite the fact that some of the diseases I mentioned are actually not endemic in India. India has successfully been certified free of transmission of Guinea worm, uh, the second country to do so in 2000. It announced the elimination of yours in 2015. It's made a huge impact on the uh, prevalence of lymphatic filariasis and its incidence with a remarkable coverage of 95% geographic coverage. And it's introduced the new triple therapy in 16 districts, treating 41 million people over the last two years. And it has a national deworming day where all the children under five are actually targeted for deworming. And I think it's coming up in the next week if I'm not uh, uh, sure, but I, I think this is the case, which is a remarkable achievement to treat those eligible for deworming in India in one day. So we see the scale of the successes here and the achievements of countries themselves because India has supported all these activities and successes through its own resources. Um, coming back to the Lancet, the Lancet series um, front cover in 2010 made this quote, which came from a work of a colleague of mine, Bernard Lisa, at the World Bank, uh, looking at the inequity in distribution of resources, that only 0.6% of official development assistance for health was allocated to tropical diseases, which affect, at that time, uh, at least a billion people, and we use that figure still. And um, so there is a gross inequity in the distribution if you're thinking about diseases which affect the majority of the poor often more than one infection of polyparasitism, polyparasitism in certain settings. Um, so this really was a headline for me to show inequity in distribution of resources. Now the road to the success uh, has been really remarkable in my judgment and it's been driven by the leadership of WHO who published some critical documents starting in I think 20, uh, 2006 with the strategy of preventive chemotherapy and followed under Dr. Lorenzo Savioli's leadership, a series of um, reports on neglected tropical diseases um, on various topics. And the, the final green one here, which I think is important, is making the rationale for the investment in controlling these diseases as entry points into poverty alleviation. Um, and the rationale really, which we are basing our work on is we're targeting the bottom billion, as we've called it in a paper. Um, the interventions themselves are 
pro-poor, so they address equity, uh, human rights, and they have an educational impact, particularly through the use of uh, drugs for soil transmitted helminths. And the intervention is cheap, it's safe, and it's cost effective. Many studies have shown this, and they're going to come to a climax shortly, hopefully, with a paper in The Lancet. <clears throat> and I have demonstrated that we proved that interventions are successful, and you can measure the results. Over the last five years, in 70 countries total, there's been over 1 billion NTD treatments. Now that is not headlined in the global health community to the extent it should be. I think this is one of the most extraordinary reaching programs there is. And it's based on very strong public-private partnerships, which have been a core to the success of the program. Um, I mentioned cost effectiveness. Many studies have shown, even before the NTD movement started, that the economic rates of return on any dollar invested is between 15 and 30 percent, which is pretty good investment for money in terms of health. The calculations that we started, Alan Fennick, myself, and Vina Nantulia, in a letter to the Lancet, was a ballpark figure on the back of an envelope, which we said was about 40 cents. Subsequent studies have shown quite clearly that the unit costs per person per year treated are of the order of 10 to 60 cents uh, US cents. The World Bank average is about 0.26. But if you look at that spend in the context of how much poorest countries spend on health, it e even then only represents between 1 and 3 percent of any country health budget in Africa. Uh, so countries could essentially afford themselves to pay for these projects given the very low unit costs. We know the, the drugs themselves which we use have multiple impacts and there are certainly links to the uh, malaria and HIV uh, problems that we know we face. We've demonstrated particularly through the community-based delivery services that these programs, treatments, are actually sustainable, uh, including school-based treatments. And we know that the community-directed treatment systems that were developed in Africa for river blindness um, are really sustained because of the community's desire for a health intervention. And it may be the only health intervention they get access to from the government health services in any one year. And in comparison with other drug donations or drug availability, donated drugs are of high quality, guaranteed by Big Pharma, and we know that they reach about 70% of the target population in any one year. If you look at World Bank figures for other drug distribution programs, uh, the level is around 12%. So we know we do better than many other programs in relation to drug distribution. Now, the emergence of NTDs as a brand is something we've emphasized. And it started really in Berlin with the colleagues, some of whom are on this call now, with a meeting which was convened by WHO and GTZ, the German aid agency. We are dependent very much on pharmaceutical partners on strong networks and influencing policy makers initially in the US Congress and in the UK Department for International Development. A critical feature of the US aid involvement was a trip by George Bush to Africa who wanted something new to announce and it was through Peter Hotez's work uh, in the Sabin Vaccine Institute at the time which acquired links to the White House which persuaded George Bush to make an initial don contribution through USA of $200 million. And Alan Fennick and I were engaged working with UK DFID uh, to acquire support for a sustained contribution to neglected tropical diseases, which I'm pleased to say is continuing. The WHO NTD department under the leadership of Lorenzo Savioli and Dirk Engels, and more recently Mala Malachella have been critical in keeping the NTD agenda high on WHO's priority list. And I can't really underestimate the, the power of Lancet in this. And as Dr. Shakir mentioned, in a meeting in 2015, um, 
I mentioned in response to WHO saying that NTDs were an epidemic. I said, no, 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 they're not an epidemic. They're a chronic pandemic. Pandemic because two, one to two billion people remain infected and it's chronic and it's not going to go away. And Richard Horton picked this up and actually referred to it uh, in Nature in Lancet the following week. Just to mention a brand. Now, this slide shows you brands which all of you around the world, wherever you're listening, recognize. Uh, and I think it's really important that actually, um, having created a brand in neglected tropical diseases, we recognize our responsibilities, uh, the context of branding, and the promise that the effective brand can bring. I just want to make one point here. Um, the top right brand is Volkswagen, and Volkswagen tarnished its brand by faking emissions uh, results when cars were tested uh, for pollution, and that really damaged the brand. So I think the really important thing to emphasize here is all these brands that you see on the top actually value the quality of their brand and their identity. And I think we must do the same in neglected tropical diseases. We must maintain the value of the brand and advocate for the brand because of its importance. Key to all our successes and the generation of the idea of neglected tropical diseases that we have a huge number, or a huge number, 10 or 12 donated products which come from this range of pharmaceutical partners. And you're all as medical personnel familiar with these brands and it started in 1988 when Merck and Co. MSD committed to make the drug ivermectin or mectizam available for as long as it was needed for onchocerciasis or river blindness in Africa. That was followed by the time, I think, Siva Gaidi, which became Novartis, who made the commitment to provide multi-drug therapy for leprosy. And the rest is history with Pfizer, Glaxo, Sanofi, Johnson & Johnson, Merck Serono, providing uh, Praziquantel, SI, the Japanese pharmaceutical company for filariasis, and Gilead for visceral leishmaniasis. The value of these products, bearing in mind that they're all essential medicines on the WHO essential medicines list, uh, is of around two to three billion dollars annually. That's their estimated value in terms of what you would have to pay if you weren't getting them donated. And I think that's really important. And we don't necessarily, in our costly figures, bring these figures into the calculations uh, because the drugs are donated free and delivered free uh, to the country uh, of entry. The other important point here is, this is a slide of the Global Alliance uh, for Lymphatic Filariasis community. It's just to emphasize that the partnerships around a disease or a group of diseases uh, are much stronger than the individual contributions. The sum is effectiveness is far greater than the individuals and that a whole comes together to be a very powerful organization working closely together. And partnership is a real key issue here, whatever disease we're talking about. Now, I want to just emphasize that the major achievement of the NTD community, in my view, uh, was the statement in the Sustainable Development Goals, accepted by all member states of the United Nations of the NTDs being part of the health target uh, number three uh, in the publication and that stemmed from lobbying which goes back I think to the time when we were frustrated about neglected diseases not being on the Millennium Development Goals published in 2000 uh, and Alan Fennick was able to get the Commonwealth Heads of Government in the G8 meeting in Den Eagles in 2005 to make a statement about neglected diseases and parasitic diseases. But the lobbying which was undertaken managed to get neglected diseases in the uh, body of the targets 
of the Sustainable Development Goals. But interventions in neglected tropical diseases relate to many of the goals here, and poverty, hunger, health obviously, improved education, issues around gender equality, clean water and sanitation, and so on. And all efforts in terms of controlling these diseases relate to most of the targets of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Particularly, as I said, the top line there, but also uh, in particular issues around partnerships, number 17. Now I want to come down to something which I believe is really important. And this is a quote from the former WHO Director General Bro Brundtland. She said, if we are serious about innovating to address infectious diseases of poverty, we need an innovative system with a focus beyond product development. And I just want to give you some examples of why innovation has been important. In some settings, you cannot use what we describe as gold standard diagnostics, which are invasive. And this is just an example of surveying for mapping where river blindness is in South Sudan or trying to detect where tropical eyeworm is because of the implications for treatment with ivermectin. You need to some, know something which is not involving snipping people's skin or taking blood. And these were techniques which were developed. And they were very innovative. They were developed in participation with the African programs. And they're very much more effective in terms of defining uh, cheaply uh, where the problems are. Uh, in the top left, you see somebody palpating nodules for river blindness. In the top right, you see somebody showing um, a picture of an eye uh, with the potential for diagnosing a tropical eyeworm. But I'm just showing you a few slides of what has emerged as highly innovative in, in terms of these programs. The top left shows a drinking straw to avoid people getting guinea worm. The top right is a dose pole for measuring the number of drugs people should have uh, for a particular uh, condition, be it schistosomiasis or lymphatic filariasis or river blindness. And that in, is a height for weight surrogate measure, which is far more effective and cheaper and less disruptive. The bottom left, this perhaps my favorite, is an exercise book which was distributed to every child in Burkina Faso which tells children how to avoid getting guinea worm. And similarly on the bottom right is a picture of somebody, or a picture of a piece of material from a West African market, which again gets across the same message of how you avoid acquiring guinea worm. Um, so people taking dirty water through a drinking straw to avoid guinea worm. And some more recent innovations which have been done by Professor Ekpo in Nigeria, of using the famous snakes and ladders game to emphasize how you avoid uh, acquiring soil transmitted worms uh, and uh, also schistosomiasis. So these are innovations which are relatively cheap and could be widely distributed through communities. And of course, cell phones have become increasingly important, um, mobile technology, uh, particularly the work that's been done and led by site savers on the global trachoma mapping project using uh, mobile technologies will be very much more important in the future and the bottom right here you see a field worker in uh, Burkina Faso communicating rumors about guinea worm um, directly from his own mobile phone. I want to emphasize now really the issue around um, the stigmatizing, uh, deforming and disabling uh, problems of neglected diseases. I've shown some of these slides already, but I want you to look at the the way this slide is um, designed in terms of COGS and the titles within the COGS, which you can always look at later. But the point here is that all these things are interactive. Um, disablement, deformity, stigma, reducing marital prospects, issues about uh, the dependence on the community of people who are uh, so disabled. The issue of reduced longevity 
associated with conditions that don't necessarily kill you. And the fact that people who are disabled are highly dependent on carers, and that will mean that those carers lose their income. Very often the carers might be children who will lose educational opportunity. There are, for people who are disadvantaged also, the need to seek uh, medical care, which may not be appropriate, but the costs of doing that drive them into a medical poverty trap. And once they're in the medical poverty trap, uh, they are really find it extremely difficult to escape uh, and they have no earned income. We know about reduced performance in education, perhaps in uh, issues around cognition associated with worm infections. Um, and those children who become carers, as I mentioned, uh, have a reduced opportunity for education. If people are unable to um, farm, there is reduced agricultural productivity. That often results in reduced nutritional um, status because when people are poor, they tend to fall back on um, staple crops uh, and therefore the nutri nutritional status is reduced because they can't afford to buy uh, to farm cash crops. Um, I think really what we are on about now with the community who are involved in NTDs is that we have to look at what is beyond the original concept. So we're moving more into issues around the links, for example, between mental health and neglected diseases, environment and biodiversity, the issues of guinea worm, which I'll talk to briefly, and the prospects of eradication, linking, as I've said, the development um, issues and the sustainable development goals. And Professor Shakir was generous to mention the uh, talks which I've been editing on uh, neglected tropical diseases and its role in capacity strengthening. Uh, I want to mention mental health first because this is a photograph of the front page of one of the WHO publications on mental health and poverty. And when I looked at the executive summary of that book, uh, and I put the bullets from the executive summary there, listing stigma and discrimination, physical abuse and sexual abuse, uh, inability to participate in society, unable to access essential health services, barriers to education and employment, uh, possibly premature death and disability. Uh, they're exactly, those bullets exactly mimic the characteristics of neglected tropical diseases. And we published a paper in 2012 on the comorbidity aspects of mental health and uh, neglected tropical diseases. And uh, then we started to work on what the burden of mental health was in filariasis. Um, this slide is slightly out of sync, but it doesn't matter. It just lists some diseases, Beruliosa, Leishmaniasis, liver blindness, filariasis, trachoma, just to exemplify the numbers of people who are um, disabled in one way or another uh, by these conditions. But the point to make is that the conditions themselves, um, while they're calculated in the Global Burden of Disease Study, aren't actually uh, representative of what the real burden is. And uh, we took some figures from the literature uh, from India, from uh, Togo, from Haiti, uh, looking at the levels of depression uh, measured uh, amongst the community. And in some communities, more than 90% of the population suffered from one form of depression or another. Uh, and uh, when we started to make the calculations based on what we knew the disability weights for mental health were, we came to the staggering fact that the calculations of the burden of mental health in filariasis were between two and five times that of the actual burden of filariasis attributed to it by the Global Burden of Disease Study. And if you start looking at the prevalence of depression in different studies and uh, filariasis, I mentioned leprosy uh, in, in various studies, the uh, prevalence of depression in leprosy is between 12 and 76 percent, in cutaneous leishmaniasis uh, between 12 and 90 percent, and in uh, Beruli ulcer um, around 50 percent. So you're talking about very significant numbers of people who are suffering from um, depressive illness already having acquired uh, a disabling condition. 
Um, and uh, I'll skip this slide because it's just a re repetition. But what I want you to emphasize is that uh, these chronic diseases, which don't kill people, create a burden of mental health disability uh, for many years, often for the length of life of the patient, uh, because uh, it may emphasize, in particular with a disease like leishmaniasis, uh, marital prospects in young women. Um, the same applies to Beruli ulcer, um, and this figure shows you from work in uh, Benin and Ghana. Uh, if you look at this, the patients find it difficult to find work, they can't work as hard, they can't contribute economically, they can't participate in festivals and rituals, uh, they're not socially active, and so on. So this is just an example of how a stigmatizing disabling condition has an impact on the family. But one of the most important papers that I've seen on this issue, and it referred to studies in India on the, the level of depression in caregivers of blind patients in India. It showed that about 50% of those people who were giving care for the blind, they themselves were suffering from depressive illness. And so you see at the bottom bullet that the prevalence of depression in caregivers increased to some 48% um, in those who were uh, caring for the most visually impaired. And this is an aspect of the care for neglected tropical disease patients that we have to take into account because of the impact on those who have the responsibility for caring for people who may be uh, irreversibly disabled. I want to mention eradication now, and you'll all be familiar with the, the famous smallpox eradication program, uh, successfully declared in 1979, uh, and the only human disease to be successfully eradicated to date. Uh, in 1978, WHO uh, created this epic poster, providing a global reward for anybody who uh, could convince uh, the medical community that smallpox, a smallpox case had been found and nobody was paid this reward which indicated that global certification could then be undertaken by the World Health Assembly. Guinea worm is one of the two diseases on the uh, calendar of the World Health Assembly for elimination and an eradication. I must get the words right. Eradication is a global phenomenon. Elimination of transmission is what happens in the country and it was certified in India in 2000 as I've said as being free of transmission um, and we have made remarkable progress across the board from 1989 through to 2020 uh, when last year I think it was 27 cases were reported in comparison with the 54 cases uh, reported in 2019 so you can see a the decline has been over 99.9% in the incidence of this infection. It remains endemic in five countries, uh, and the challenge is now to certify the absence of transmission in those countries, as well as in DRC and Sudan. But we have a problem that since 2012, a significant numbers of infections have been detected in dogs, in particular in Chad. Um, this shows a, a WHO weekly epidemiological record uh, front page saying yours has been eradicated in India in 2015 um, and that was a great achievement but WHO didn't get the terminology right. Eradication is not a country issue, it's a global issue so this paper should have been elimination of yours in India. And I make that point because even WHO don't get the terminology correct. Now we all talk about the end game, be it in elimination programs or in eradication programs. And we categorize these in some papers uh, in 2013 and 14, belong to four, ca five categories, six categories. Biological, that means drug efficacy and monitoring, socio-geographic, logistic issues around supply chains, the cost of monitoring and evaluation and surveillance, and the strategic issues about implementing relatively complex strategies. 
um, technical issues, the availability of diagnostics, the need for new drug formulations. And I pick an example there of the need for a pediatric formulation of praziquantil to treat uh, young children with trichistosomiasis. And the issues of whether countries are going to take that policy recommendations and implement them. And we also wanted to emphasize the issues around comorbidity, the links between HIV and urogenital schistosomiasis, that women, in fact, uh, who have um, urogenital schistosomiasis um, are more susceptible to HIV. I mentioned mental health, but I want to mention in terms of the neurology, neurological conditions, human African trypanosomiasis, neurocystisicosis, um, onchocerciasis um, associated epilepsy, and cancers. All these conditions, um, particularly the cancers, uh, are not included, uh, or the NTD associated cancers are not included in the Global Burden of Disease study. Injuries such as snake bite and rabies uh, are not included because the Global Burden calculations don't attribute the mortality or, and morbidity associated with these conditions as NTD derived. So we have to make the case that if somebody is bitten by a rabid dog and dies, or is bitten by a snake, it is an NTD-derived uh, condition. And the same with cancers. I mentioned briefly HIV and schistosomiasis. <clears throat> Lesions in the female genital tract are linked very elegantly by a Danish, a Norwegian, sorry, a gynecologist, Aon Ketlin, and colleagues to HI, higher levels of HIV transmission. I'll move on from that. But I just want to mention neurology and NTDs, about which you're most familiar. Um, Neurocystosicosis uh, epilepsy, epilepsy is or has been estimated to cause about 30% of global epilepsy. Um, human African trypanosomiasis has got long term neurological sequelae. Um, we know in the great work that Robert Cole Bundes from Antwerp is doing about onco epilepsy and nodding syndrome. Um, he calls it river epilepsy because of the link between river blindness and onchocerciasis transmission. But there's still an open question about much of the epidemiology of that condition. Rabies you know about, but a, a, not an NTD in WHO's terms, but cerebral toxoplasmosis is, and you will tell me better than I can tell you, uh, um, certainly a underestimated cause of uh, neurological problems. Uh, that's geniocellium, the cause of neurocystisicosis. I won't, um, uh, and that has a really big impact in some of the poorer areas, particularly in terms of the rural economies where pork uh, is unsafe to eat, it reduces the, is the value of pigs and uh, meat products, and it provides a major constraint for smallholder pig production. So, coming towards the end, what, what can we learn over our 20 years experience? Um, I think that whilst we all started very much with our individual diseases and experiences, we need to look at these diseases through the lens of poverty, issues of equity and gender, human rights, access to universal uh, essential medicines. Uh, and if we can't solve NTDs, um, they've been described by Dirk Engels and colleagues as a litmus test uh, of the success of development programs. And of course, we have to link them to the NTDs. I tried to emphasize that innovation is important. And the innovation I described really was driven by the people at the, the sharp end in the communities who made the, those ideas possible uh, and brought them to fruition. Very simple uh, improvements in um, interventions. Um, I also, in that context, want to uh, emphasize, although I think the COVID vaccine development has been a spectacular success, that usually the timescales to development of new products is often decades. And in NTDs, we've had low expectations for magic bullets. We really do need to continue to emphasize the importance of linking uh, these programs together. Filariasis, malaria and bed nets, HIV, schisto, the role of surveillance programs and the benefits, for example, the guinea worm program 
has derived from its association with polio programs. <clears throat> we need to emphasize that we have an economic case and we've said that NTB interventions are actually one of the best buys, if not the best buy in public health. Um, I think that is borne out by the sustainability of the numbers treated over recent years. We are dealing with delivering free essential drugs to the poorest populations, which has to be a major contribution to the aspirations for universal health coverage. In terms of epidemiology, I think we've learned to expect the unexpected. Uh, and the best example I'm aware of is the emergence of guinea worm in dogs. But what we know is, and this is where it's important to all the global medical community, is you have to have advocacy for your projects and your ideas by the highest level, at the highest level. And I want to say that, draw your attention to the fact that I think completely unexpectedly, uh, we had a tweet from Boris Johnson on World NTD Day a week ago, uh, commending the programs that uh, the UK government has been able to support. The fact that the Prime Minister was going to talk about NTDs in a tweet 20 years ago, for me, would probably be unthinkable. Um, and I think Margaret Chan linked it at an early stage, universal health coverage to NTDs as the ultimate expression of fairness. And I use for my students uh, the six E's, equity, essential medicines, efficacy, efficacity. It's ethical, it provides a level of equality, and we can eliminate and eradicate. And I've since come up with some take-home thoughts and joining the docs of nine C's. We are exposed to climate change, which is inevitably going to change the epidemiology. Conflict-associated uh, problems in terms of accessing populations for, be it treatment, surveillance, um, and uh, access. Uh, we are dependent and continue to be dependent on the extraordinary collaboration and cooperation of our different communities. The communities themselves at the sharp end delivering drugs uh, as volunteer workers, reaching very many people throughout the remote areas, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. The challenge that we face in issues around cross borders, the link, for example, between Chad guinea worm and Cameroon guinea worm in recent months has been a concern. Uh, and we know we are able to make some impact on controlling these diseases, but control in many conditions is not adequate and we need to eliminate. We need to engage civil society. Capacity strengthening is essential. Without people who know what they're doing and are committed, uh, we will have a problem. And of course, COVID has had an impact on health service capacity for obvious reasons. And uh, we are committed to putting the NTDs into the universal health coverage ag agenda. But over the last 10 years or so, we've been faced with all sorts of challenges. I suspect we will continue to be so. Uh, the top left is the global financial crash. We had Ebola interrupt NTD programs in three countries in Africa. We've had earthquakes. Um, we've had Donald Trump. We've had ISIS. We've had Brexit. And we have continued uh, insecurity in many parts of, of uh, West Africa, uh, in fact. And um, also we have the challenge of non-community diseases. Uh, pollution, mental health, um, the picture in the bottom uh, in the centre is a picture of Syria and the devastation that's been caused there by war. Uh, top right is road traffic accidents which are all too familiar part of public health uh, and non-communicable, not diseases, but non-communicable health conditions in the tropics. And the fact that non-communal diseases such as diabetes and heart disease in the tropical world is increasing. So to conclude, NTDs are markers and drivers of poverty. Um, NTD control can make a proportionately greater contribution in my judgment on the basis of the evidence available uh, as an investment you get more health for less money. Um, and that 
policy messages based on strong scientific evidence and programmatic success, exemplified by the fact that over the last five years, each year over one billion annual treatments have been given in over 70 countries. And I always think that if we can't deliver free essential drugs to poor people, we're unlikely to be able to solve the more complex issues of international health. NTDs, as I say, are low hanging fruit with a proven record of success, be it control, elimination or near eradication. And we have an obligation to maintain the momentum. And just some acknowledgements uh, to my own institution, the Department for International Development, GlaxoSmithKline, WHO, Connected and Donation Programme, my colleagues at Sightsavers, Royal Society of Tropical Medicine, and many individuals, uh, some of whom are listed here. Uh, but it's been a collaborative effort, and I speak on behalf, in particular, of um, my colleagues Peter Allen, Lorenzo Salvioli, um, who've been on a long journey, but I think one which has shown we've been able to make some kind of impact. So thank you very much for this privilege and opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Molnew, for a wonderful, wonderful, uh, really trip across this huge, huge topic, and we are most grateful. Now, as you said, we have six panelists. I think um, many of them are co-authors of papers and workers which you've worked with over the years, and uh, I'm going to ask each one of them for a short comment on, on their assessment of the topic from the declaration in London of 2000, and is it 2010? Until 2020. It was, it was 12. I it was like 12, to, yes. If I may, I make one comment. Uh, just Please because do. today, just to exemplify the fact we continue, Jürgen Singer, uh, Alan Fenwick and myself have just finalized some proofs on a paper on urban schistosomiasis, uh, a systematic review. So we continue. <laughs> <laughs> That's so nice to hear. Thank you very much. Just to move on from that, then um, may I ask um, Professor Alan Fenwick to make a comment, please, if you have anything yeah. to comment upon. We'll be very, very Grateful for that. Professor Fennick, please. Thank you very much. Well, obviously, I can't compare with the uh, very comprehensive paper and uh, presentation by David. And, and as usual, David, it was a great pleasure to hear it. As you wrote to me, I've heard it many times and you've heard me many times, but uh, we've worked together for 20 years. I'd like to make sort of five very quick points and there'll just be one sentence. The first thing is that the whole, uh, apart from the uh, original uh, donation against river blindness, really the key to us all getting started was money from Bill and Melinda Gates around 1999 through to 2002, because that really gave a level of money which we'd never seen for these neglected tropical diseases before. And then that money, once that money was sort of uh, being used, in 2006 and seven and eight, we had uh, further and uh, bilateral money in from USAID and DFID, as David said, and from one or two very generous uh, uh, high net worth individuals from, and we've moved forward from there. The second thing is um, the advocacy that we've all done, because when uh, we started SCI and we went in to see 12 or 14 uh, countries that we wanted to work in initially in Africa, not one of the five-year national plans had the word schistosomiasis, river blindness, or even uh, deworming in schools. Not one of them in the year 2000 in the countries in Africa had any emphasis uh, on uh, uh, those diseases. And uh, I would say that uh, five years later, when the next round of five-year plans were, uh, were being developed, in every case, there was a mention of deworming in schools, uh, child health, and um, the control of uh, particularly river blindness, lymphatic filariasis, and schistosomiasis. The next big um, uh, item in our agenda, so to speak, was an expansion of the drug donations and the collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry. 
in those days, the pharmaceutical industry were the bad guys, but certainly not for the neglected tropical disease people. They were the good guys. And without uh, the massive, massive donations that we've received uh, by the top four or five uh, pharmaceutical companies, and they've all committed uh, for the long term, we wouldn't have been able to uh, increase the number of treatments that have been delivered uh, from a few hundred thousand uh, in the year 2000 to, as the figure David mentioned, over a billion every year now. So bilateral aid uh, followed on from the Gates Foundation. But the other thing that uh, then came was that in the year 2000, there were a few of us were all working on neglected tropical diseases but in small compartments. So David was doing trips and maybe uh, and LF. Uh, I was schisto and deworming, and there were others working on uh, leprosy and the other uh, neglected tropical diseases. And by the year 2000, we'd all come together and we were talking integration of our efforts because we were all targeting the same people. And we were trying to raise funds each for our own disease. And so we got together um, and started uh, looking at the uh, definition, neglected tropical diseases instead of the individual diseases and all collaborating. And, and I think the one thing that really came through from David's presentation was how all of us really collaborated. We used to meet several times a year and we advocated to USAID and DFID in particular. And it was the collaborative uh, advocacy that we that we did that was so successful um, so finally just to uh, to pay tribute to the NGOs the bilateral donors the World Health Organization but mainly then what developed was local ownership and every one of us who were working together from uh, the developing country uh, developed countries, we're encouraging the countries themselves, their ministries of health and ministries of education to own their own programs. And actually that has really proved to be successful in the last 12 months because the control of neglected tropical diseases, although uh, the conditions have been very difficult, have gone ahead, even though the expatriates could not uh, go out and visit and uh, encourage uh, and fund the local programs are continuing. And I think that's a great tribute to everybody. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fennig. That's a very nice five points to wrap everything in, in your opinion, which we really appreciate. I think we are learning a lot of how to do things. And I'll come about a question about that to all of you in a little, in a little time. Now, Professor Savioli, are you, are you with us, Professor Savioli? Professor Lorenzo Savioli. Oh, I don't see him. He has not joined. Um, okay. Well, we have uh, we have uh, Dr. Otzinger from the Swiss Tropical Health Institute. Dr. Otzinger, please. Thank you very much. Uh, as an end, as an entry point, uh, we had actually David Molyneux just a week ago with our postdoctoral students here at Swiss TPH. And I can also promise you that for a younger audience, he was really inspirational. Uh, David had in his last slide, he emphasized, remember, you are only as good as your last performance. And I can assure you, David, this was a great performance. <laughs> I have only three points. Uh, and some of them follow up on what Ellen, uh, my dear colleague Ellen, already very nicely summarized. I would like to emphasize as the first point, it needs the best science to address the most neglected issues. And I think what you have seen here from David and many others, it's indeed excellent science that has moved the NTD field forward. Second, what I very much appreciated is once the science was there and large control programs started, on the backbone of these control programs, there was great opportunity for operational research. And this research then, again, emphasized, helped 
sharpening the program. So it was a kind of an iterative process. You have the program on this back, you do operational research, you refine, you adopt, you improve your program. And on top, this allowed to train, teach, educate the next generation. This capacity building has been extremely important. If you go to some of the countries, you have now people who were trained in these programs who have become maybe uh, ministers of health, uh, you name it. The third point, and this is really where I nevertheless see a big challenge. Alan talked about the integration. My feeling is the integration does not yet go far enough. Integration of just two drugs to address two uh, uh, diseases is not sufficient. If we have a, a chronic pandemic, we need to address the root causes of these diseases. And this is where I think much more needs to be done. Integration in terms of different sectors, it's not just the health, it needs the financial, the water and sanitation, many, many other sectors. And this is hard because you talk different languages, but this is really needed at the end to eliminate some of these diseases. Back to you, Dr. Shakir. Thank you very much. That's really, really very thought provoking and I'm most grateful. Um, can I move to uh, Professor Hortez? Is Peter Hortez on the call? No, I, uh, Simon Bush is uh, here. Yeah, I'll come to him in a minute. But I wanted to ask Professor Hortez about his paper, which is entitled The Rise and Fall of neglected tropical diseases in East Asia Pacific. If I can put this to our panel, does anybody want to comment on this paper, which was uh, published recently uh, in, in Acta Tropica, um, where Professor Hotes talks about this and the current estimates, and he talks about the, the specifically uh, the uh, East Asia Pacific region, or maybe if he's not there, we will just not mention it and we will move on. Um, now we come to Simon Bush, director of NTD at the Sight Savers. And uh, please, to, please, uh, can I ask Professor Bush to tell us the take on the I suppose it is onchocerciasis that they are interested in and river blindness, or am before, I wrong? Before I'm Simon, sure more probably. Before Simon comes on, I'll just give Peter Hotez a phone call uh, to remind him and see if he can uh, if he can log on. Well, that would be welcome. Thank you, if he can. Thank you, Dr. Shakir. David, thank you very much for the for the very elegant uh, presentation. Um, yeah. I think you've, you've hit on many of the key issues. You, you touched on integration um, as one of the key issues. And very often people get very hung up about well, what do we mean by integration in terms of, of global health and particularly neglected tropical diseases. I think we just need to go to any uh, busy primary healthcare clinic um, in uh, NTD endemic countries uh, to uh, see what integration is uh, practically. Um, I think what, what you've shown is that uh, we need to show that elimination is possible. It's a very powerful word in advocacy, a very powerful word in glo global health. And we have the evidence of um, elimination of, of uh, blinding trachoma in Ghana, the first sub-Saharan Africa, African country to reach that. Uh, lymphatic filariasis in Yemen, uh, lymphatic filariasis in Togo, and many more. And I think we need to, to utilize those examples of where we have met uh, those elimination targets uh, and show that it is possible. We need to show the donors that this is entirely possible. And we need to show them what the gap is uh, to reach uh, those overall uh, global targets. I think what also David showed is that how policy and advocacy needs to be based on scientific evidence. Uh, that has led to what uh, you, you've, uh, is often called the NTD movement, 
which involves all of the partners from the drug donation programs to civil society, uh, non-governmental organizations like my own research, um, acad acad uh, the academic community, but also those who are implementing uh, in the field. And uh, 20 years ago, there were no NTD plans in most African countries. They did not exist. Now, an NTD plan and an NTD approach is uh, has been concluded in every sub-Saharan African country. So we now, as donors and partners, can help deliver that plan. And David, you touched on the community-based and the community-directed treatment approach. This philosophy has, has proved itself successful in the global pandemic of COVID-19 that we're finding ourselves in now. Programs have continued to deliver. Yes, in March, April, there was a pause. They picked up and they're now working uh, to uh, deliver within the constraints that COVID-19 uh, poses uh, to us. And that shows the strength of this engagement with, with uh, communities. And I know there are going to be many challenges ahead, and you, you picked up on those challenges, David, to meet the global elimination targets. We've got the, uh, the issues of conflict and uh, problems with cross-border uh, activities. Um, this is going to trip us up as we reach uh, the last mile uh, in the elimination program and, and, the, and the WHO plan up to 2030. Um, but again, we need to go back and show what has been achieved uh, and really track how we achieve the, ne the next 10 years of, of success in, in NTDs. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hear that uh, Dr. Peter Hotes is, is joined as is Dr. Hotes on the line? Um, he did tell me he was joining now. Excellent. Well, we'll just give it a minute and see if he does. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm just asking Kiran Thakur from Colombia. Kiran is an expert on neurological infections, and she uh, may have a comment to make after hearing all of this. Kiran, do you have a comment? Kiran Thakur, I can't see her. That's all right. Now, may I just ask you all about, you know, this declaration in 2012 about NTDs and the, 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 set, the goal you set yourself for 2020 and then moving on for another 10 years from 2020 onwards. This reminds me of a declaration which was made by the G8 in London in 2013, and the declaration was signed by all heads of states, including uh, who were in London. At that time, Putin was involved as well, before it became G7. And it's a declaration on dementia. And the goal they set was they should eliminate, not the word eliminate, but have a, a, a disease modifying treatment for dementia, which is very broad, by 2025. We all thought that did not have the ammunition that you had in NTDs. And the ammunition in NTD is participation of drug companies, participation of philanthropies, participation, et cetera, et cetera, governments. And we all feel, well, 2025 is only three, four years from now, and we are no way near uh, I know dementia is different to NTDs, but one, these declarations are made, and in our world, in neurology, our biggest disease probably is stroke and dementia. And the problem is how to motivate them to do more. How to motivate them, I mean countries. If you depend on countries, I think you will end up like us, but you did not depend on governments. Am I wrong in this analysis? I, I open it to everybody, maybe starting with David. What is your, it, it's not a good analogy, but it's the only one that we have, David. And uh, I, I think it's worth getting it from people like yourselves who have done such declarations 
Um, now it is 11 years ago. So David, maybe to start with. And Dr. Shaka Peter Hotez is now here. Excellent, uh, excellent. Is he, is he? He's, uh, he's under the name of Jörg Utzinger. I think he's uh, somehow managed to be uh, duplicated or cloned. It looks like I've gotten I've gotten an upgrade actually. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Hotes. I'll come to you in a minute. I asked a question, and maybe from this discussion, and after that, I'll come back well, to you. Well, first of all, let me thank uh, Jurg, Allen, and uh, Simon for their comments, um, and I essentially uh, endorse everything they said in the time I had available. I, the, the, these this topic requires probably several hours of of, of uh, discussion anyway but as far as aspirations for um targets are concerned let me just say that my sense is that these very much are political uh, peter allen lorenzo and myself have just written a paper on the history of the ntd movement really emphasizing and you referred to it dr shakir the london declaration actually ntds ntds did not start at the london declaration um, it was Lorenzo, I think, who actually helped bring together uh, with WHO Bill Gates to chair a meeting. And if Bill Gates makes himself available to chair a meeting, then everybody jumps and comes up with some uh, uh, money or commitment. Uh, and that has a generator in effect. But going back to 2007, and with Lorenzo here, we had a very successful meeting in Geneva, which uh, brought some more drug donation commitments into the system. Now, um, we set a target in 2000 to eliminate filariasis as a public health problem um, by 2020. It was an aspiration, uh, but as um, Simon Bush said, uh, with respect to Ivanko and so on and so forth, uh, and filariasis and trachoma, some of those targets have been achieved, which shows it is doable if there is that level of commitment. The, 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 the science, the technology, the monitoring, the evaluation uh, is possible. And it has been, if you take river blindness in the Americas, um, for, uh, four out of the six endemic countries have successfully eliminated transmission. And it's been verified in Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, and Guatemala. The only problem area, and I didn't have time to talk about that, was in the Venezuela-Brazil border, where you have these isolated Yamamami populations, which are extremely difficult to access. So you have to expect that the purists on the elimination of transmission front um, sometimes can't be satisfied. But you've got to look at the overall global progress. And you can see the numbers of people from various papers who have uh, been freed of uh, river blindness. Now, I was involved in 74 with the River Blindness Control uh, Program in West Africa, and that set a, a target. And that target was the elimination of blinding onchocerciasis as a public health problem. It was very clear. Didn't say anything about skin disease, uh, river epilepsy. It said blinding onchocerciasis. That was achieved because mm. the definition of a public health problem was defined in entomological terms and in um, uh, uh, prevalence of microfilarial load terms. What was important about that is that nobody now becomes blind in West Africa from onchocerciasis. Now, if that is not a public health achievement, I don't know what is. You will see people who have some skin disease, you will have some, some visual impairment, and there will be some people with low levels of parasites in their skin. But a public, that is not a public health problem. The same applies to filariasis. Remember, as I said in the beginning of this talk, China did it on the basis of DEC fortified salt in the 1950s and 1960s in a population of 350 million people. So it's feasible. You're up against targets which become increasingly stringent, such as eradication. And we see that from the guinea worm program at the moment and we see it from polio. Polio has now got the problem of these vaccine-derived polio uh, strains, which are you know, emerging in, in many parts of, of Africa. But 
Africa has succeeded in eliminating wild polio virus transmission. And, but what you see or have seen in the of the guinea worm program is the targets have been pushed further and further out and we have to be extremely careful about that i, I won't say any more i think peter will probably have a few words to say thank you thank you thank you very much i'll i'll uh, i'll just say one word about this is that the difference between the if it is the declaration in, in uh, on ntds and the declaration on dementia which was signed by Obama and Putin and at that time Cameron wow. and the Prime Minister of Japan. It's a, a condition where we have no clear cause, no clear strategy yet. The first one it says, set an ambition to identify a cure or a disease modifying therapy of dementia by 2025. And they signed on it, all of them. So it just makes us neurologists wonder what advice does these heads uh, of state the, get and who advises them and that's another political I, I issue think, which i'll I not think, come to <laughs> i just come to make one point before peter i think having heard boris johnson um speak on twitter there's one person who gave him advice on that because i know him and so does alan in this country uh, chris witty who is chris is a uh, a very distinguished tropical physician who has been a, a staunch member of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine uh, and he knows what he's talking about um, and he wrote a paper uh, I can't remember the title um, I'm not sure which journal it was either it's certainly in the British Journal talking about eradication and elimination five years ago which I can quote and I can find you it said elimination and eradication be careful what you wish for and I mean, that was from Chris Whitty, I think, who we all, the medical community in the UK, respect deeply. And, but you're right. I mean, if you don't have a, if you don't, I mean, I'm not a neurologist, but I know that there must be many potential causes of, of, of dementia. And if you can't pinpoint the cause, then you're very, it's very difficult to find a solution. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we leave the, the last comment to uh, Professor Hotez before we open it and maybe Wolfgang Grizzle can take questions from the audience, but um, Peter Hotes, can I ask you a question about a paper and maybe explain it to me? The rise and fall of neglected tropical diseases in East Asia Pacific. I think it's one of your one of your recent papers. Uh, and uh, what what did you mean exactly by what was published in Acta Tropica just in December or even January? Gone. Well, let me let me actually, if I can, even enlarge it a little bit around this whole issue of neuroscience and infectious and neglected diseases, because I think, you know, you're on to something extremely important. And and of course, it takes David in his unique way to be able to connect the dots that only a David Molyneux paper can connect dots. And and and, you know, he's been writing about mental health aspects and neglected tropical diseases now for a few years. And. The minute I just saw the title, I didn't even have to read the paper. I said the title, he, he connected a key dot there because he, he highlights the fact that so many of our neglected tropical diseases actually operate through neuroscience mechanisms. And yet this is almost, I don't wanna say it's an almost wholly unexplored area, but it's an inadequately explored area. Let me give you some examples, even beyond the neglected tropical diseases, Almost every infectious disease has a neuroscience aspect that's largely un understudied. For instance, malaria. I mean, why do children die of, under the age of five die of malaria? At least a large percentage, maybe a third or more, die because of cerebral malaria. And we still don't really understand the pathogenesis. We know malaria infected red cells sludge in the cerebral vasculature. Somehow that leads to deposition of malaria pigment. Somehow that leads to brain swelling. And somehow children go into coma and, and often never come out of coma. That's what we know about cerebral malaria um, or the fact that HIV, uh, the HIV virus that caused HIV AIDS is, an, is overwhelmingly a neurotropic virus. And it took us taking care of AIDS patients for many years to realize this. Uh, even uh, when we get to COVID-19, we're only now, it's like peeling away the layers of an onion, starting to realize the full neurologic impact of COVID-19, which may be one of the most important that uh, individuals uh, suffer um, stroke, of course, 
from the vascular events, but beyond that is long-term cognitive dysfunction, what many refer to as brain fog, what uh, many uh, point out is uh, chronic depression. And now, because of all the intense focus on COVID-19, there's revelations that this virus is activating microglial cells and contributing to somehow these events leading to what, we're, what some are calling brain fog or cognitive dysfunction and depression in, in the brain. So, uh, and then when you look at the individual neglected tropical diseases, it, it took us a while and, and David's revelations to kind of uh, piece, the, piece it all together. But as we started look going deeper into uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and looking at the onchocerciasis patients and realizing many of them are suffering ep from epilepsy uh, or the kids from, from nodding syndrome, uh, or the mental health stigma uh, associated with so many of these neglected tropical diseases. And if you go down the list of the uh, neglected tropical diseases listed by the World Health Organization, the 20 or so, most of them probably have some key important neuroscience aspect. Sleeping sickness, uh, definitely. Leishmaniasis, the, the terrible uh, stigma of the chronic ulcers uh, on, on the face that uh, David and Fred Bailey and others have been, have been writing about. And I think, you know, we have to take a step back and, you know, maybe use the excuse of COVID-19 to take a step back and look at this and really expand this whole neuroscience infectious disease aspect and recognize that microbial pathogenesis uh, ha is an important area unto itself of neuroscience and, and, and how we link that and kind of mainstream uh, the microbiology and infectious disease components of neuroscience as a, as a major area of neuroscience and vice versa within infectious diseases. We do have some neurologist physicians who get specialty training in infectious diseases, but it's, you know, it's barely a handful uh, in, in the United States that really explore this area uh, in depth. And, and, and certainly when you look at even chronic neurologic conditions, more and more in them, the more you spend time with them, there's some evidence that there may be a neurologic component, such as uh, multiple sclerosis and, uh, and, and other neurologic uh, conditions. So I think this might be a good jumping off point, starting off point to start thinking about that microbial neuroscience uh, access that it, it, I think it's far more profound uh, than, uh, than many of us have given credit for in, in the past and congratulate David for kind of uh, being among the first to really uh, br bring this to light and, and say it in a more explicit way than many of us are thinking, which is always one of the, uh, one of the among the genius of, of, uh, of David and, and my colleagues like Jörg and, and Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Hotez. I pass on to Professor Grizzle to maybe answer some, is there any questions? No, there are just a few comments about the excellent lecture, which I can only echo. And I, I, I just would like to summarize from my point of view that this was really very inspiring. And I just want to point out three points. One is this nine C's, which I think are very impressive. Uh, your wonderful achievement with public partnership, public-private partnership, because we always think of, expect states to help our organizations. And thirdly, also, of course, I think this big concern for mental disease, which seems so natural when one looks at it. But if I may ask a question to David, uh, what about the peripheral nervous system? Most diseases that were spoken of and discussed as were central nervous diseases and skin diseases. Is there any particular uh, of your um, last experience uh, that affects in particular the peripheral nervous system? Except leprosy, of course. Well, I could, that? I just, I, I it, the volume it, was just a bit low. Is asking oh. about the per, the peripheral nervous system and and neglected diseases. Well, I think um, I think the classic there is leprosy, isn't it? Yes, I mean apart from leprosy, yes. <laughs> but uh, well, also, what I was what I what I would add is something you know uh, clearly Guillain Barre syndrome is 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 uh, incredibly common and 
uh, among some infectious diseases, and we don't understand why. And I'm not sure the the classic model always holds up. So, for instance, uh, with Zika virus infection, we started to see Guillain-Barré syndrome occur occur very early on in the course of this virus infection, and almost too early to ascribe it to the usual pathogenic mechanisms that we invoke, which is um, an autoimmunity, a host inflammatory and antibody response to the virus. And the reason is because it was occurring, you know, almost uh, contemporaneously with the onset of symptoms. So uh, even though it was classically manifest as Guillain-Barre, it, it, it was hard, it's hard to imagine how this was due to a, um, uh, a host an antibody response to the virus, given the timing. So what what's going on in terms of virus invasion of the peripheral nervous system and and what is the activation and you know increasingly that it's, it's clear that certain viruses are triggering microglial cells and oligodendrocytes just like we're seeing in COVID-19 which also has a Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome component so I, I think you know yes there's there's probably a very important access there that again is more hypothesis generating than than testing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have no further questions here, unfortunately. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yes, please uh, go ahead. Please. Dr. Walton. Uh, it's a lovely lecture. I mean, I'm very inspiring and been actually wanting to listen to, a, to this lecture by Dr. Molyneux for, for a long, long time. And I think it's extremely inspirational. This, uh, just a comment, especially with uh, regard to uh, neurological disorders, uh, the neglected neurological disorders in, in terms of transmissible diseases. So whilst we have some of them like cystisocosis, which we understand very well, and the relationship to neurological morbidity uh, is, is pretty clear, but uh, there are uh, certain, uh, you clearly mentioned that uh, India seems to have been spared of those diseases, you know, particularly like onchocerciasis, uh, even for that matter, malaria, where we do not really understand what is the basic lesion uh, or, or what particular part of the brain is really affected. I mean, we know that there is an association between uh, river blindness and epilepsy. But, but I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about the fact that we have really not been able to find a hard lesion, uh, which explains epilepsy. I think likewise in malaria, what exactly, I mean, part of it is probably due to the lack of availability of imaging, um, imaging services in much of uh, the world where these uh, diseases are ex extremely common. But, but I think the doctor Yes, thank you. I think this was a very difficult question. David, would you like to give a comment on that interesting aspect? If I, if I got the question about the, the, the mechanisms of some of these um, pathologies, um, I mean, I'm certainly not a malariologist, but I know my, my colleagues in uh, Malawi uh, several years ago had a major project on trying to understand the pathology of cerebral malaria and that was Malcolm Molyneux and we're no relation and Terry Taylor and I don't know how far that work has gone um, I think one of the problems is actually uh, they they were able to do this work because they got for the first time authority for post-mortems on, on children who died of cerebral malaria under fairly strict conditions and ethical con controls and so on um, but we've had uh, and I don't know how far that work has gone, uh, and I have to confess to a degree of ignorance in this area, but the other area which I didn't mention, which has been particularly interesting, and uh, the neurologists amongst you may be able to explain it, and that is the um, issue of the ivermectin-induced uh, uh, encephalopathy is associated with the uh, lower, lower parasite in Central Africa, where you get... Uh, uh, when you have very high levels of um, microflaria of this tropical eyeworm, lower, lower, um, 
and you use ivermectin, you get a high proportion of encephalopathies in those patients that are inadvertently treated. Um, and again, I don't think we have any idea about what is the, the true pathology of that. Um, but the analogy there is that, um, and this is where veterinary neurologists may be able to help, you can't give ivermectin as a drug to, um, to sheep dogs. So there's something very specific about a breed of dog which um, uh, basically if you give ivermectin to dogs they they um, they uh, this particular breed of dog they die and i'm not sure somebody knows the answer to that and i'm afraid i don't so you have to be very careful with the interpretation of some of these results but as i say i i, I stop at neurology because i'm not neurologist. Uh, David, you know, when, when, as I've heard you speak, I, I'm reminded of um, one of your predecessors who was, uh, I was not old enough to have ever met him, but Brian McGrath at, uh, at Liverpool, yeah. uh, who did a lot of important work, really pinning down the role of malaria pigment uh, in, in, the, in the brain. And in some ways, we've not progressed too far beyond that. We know the pigment is there. I mean, you could see, you know, at postmortem, the changes in, in, in the brain resulting from the pigment. It has to be doing something, right? It's, it must be producing some type of metabolic changes. And then Terry Taylor doing those MRIs that you mentioned uh, was able to show this, the swelling that's linked to it. So somehow it's, we, we still haven't connected all of the links between the, the presence of the schizons attaching to the endothelial cells uh, of the cerebral vasculature, deposition of malaria pigment, and then swelling. And, and, you know, here, you know, and oftentimes, you know, young people say to me, you know, they want to make a big impact on global health. Uh, what should I do, Dr. Hotez or Professor Hotez? I say, look, become a neurologist and crack the code of, of cerebral malaria. That's would be a profoundly important uh, contribution. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, about the links between the epilepsy and, and river blindness. I mean, we clearly, in this case, the, I don't think microfilaria are present in the, in the brain. Uh, uh, so there, there must be some other plausible mechanism and, and also the encephalopathy of Loa Loa. So I, my hunch is that the, uh, a meta, metabolomic study would be very fruitful in terms of, of picking some up, some of this up. Thank I you. just want to ask uh, Professor David, from your comfort zone, what inspired you to go to Africa countries, Latin America, and do this study on neglect neglected tropical diseases? Uh, I just think I enjoyed travel, and I was very lucky. Uh, I think, I, I mean, in part, I said some of this in my uh, talk with the colleagues in Switzerland a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think I was very lucky. I had some opportunities. I took those opportunities. And I think the importance of networks and friendships and collegiality is absolutely critical here. Um, and um, I uh, had an opportunity to go to, to Africa. And I also had the opportunity to work with some fantastic mentors who um, really gave me an awful, an awful lot of support. And WHO was important um, at one stage in my career. Um, but I, uh, I'm also fascinated by not travel, uh, the beauty of the African, the African environment and the cultures. Um, I'm certainly far, far less experienced than um, uh, in Asia and uh, the Americas than um, uh, other colleagues are. Um, but I just enjoy travel. I enjoy people. I enjoy different cultures. And I think that the opportunity to be paid to do work in those environments is an enormous privilege because that just enriches your life and it allows you to see other people's perspective um, and to be able to work and enjoy work and be paid to do work is, is a real privilege. But whether or not I get on another aeroplane is another matter and I suspect <laughs> we all feel the same. Could I, could I comment on that an question as well? Goes to an airport. If I could uh, comment on that question, because uh, I spent 34 years in, living in Africa and the Middle East, and uh, it was such a pleasure because 
when I first went to Africa, if there was one university in each country, it was doing well. Today, there are many, many universities in each country. And to see the development of the, uh, the African scientists and the um, quality of the staff in the ministries of health and ministries of education over a 35 year period has been a joy to behold. And I've got an awful lot of people in an awful lot of countries that I call friends. Thank you. Uh, Professor Meshram, can I come with one final comment on yes, please. Professor Hotez, if I may. Peter, can I just tell you that the, the recent publication a week ago, and more recently, that GBS, Gillian Barry syndrome, is not really being seen in COVID-19 infection as much as we expect. And there are even statements have been made that GBS does not so far follow COVID. There's something there which we don't know compared to other viral illnesses or the immunity induced by COVID. And it's just a, a statement which is being made more and more in neurological. It's interesting because, it, because the early papers, and again, a lot of it was coming out of the UK, yeah. found that there were peripheral neuropathies linked to COVID-19 and they were calling it Guillain-Barre, but perhaps now they're, they're finding some other maybe uh, they're calling it something else, but uh, maybe it's not classic Guillain-Barre, but there does to be some peripheral neuropathy that's been linked to it. Yeah. But overwhelmingly, the big concern um, with, with Guillain-Barre is more the Zika virus infection, whereas with COVID-19, it's the central nervous system issues that are really yeah. troubling. Yeah, thank you. I just thought I, I'll bring this comment to, so that it, 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 there is a difference and we don't know what it is between Zika induced peripheral neuropathy and now COVID yeah. which is affecting millions of people and not, not really causing as much GBS um, as one would expect. So there's a difference, thank you. Professor Meshram. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think we had a great session. It was really an inspirational talk by Professor David and his journey has been excellent. And uh, we for a long time wanted, as Dr. Gagandeep said, to have his talk, but then uh, today was the day. And uh, uh, through this, uh, you know, as a tropical neurology specialty group of WFN, uh, we would like to be associated and work for the neglected tropical diseases. And not only Professor David, that uh, through him, we could, uh, you know, connect with uh, Professor Peter Hotez, uh, uh, Professor Jag uh, Udzinger, uh, Ellen Fenick, and uh, uh, Professor Simon Bush. And it was great. And I would like to thank everyone uh, to be here with us. And I would like to also thank uh, Professor uh, Wolfgang Grissol uh, for his inaugural address and Professor Raj Shakir uh, for being with us all the time and chairing the session. And Professor uh, James K. Murthy, I am president, uh, Professor Steve Lewis, uh, Professor Sarvesh Katrak, Dr. Gagandeep Singh, and all others, and uh, the whole audience. Uh, uh, and uh, the next uh, month, that is in March, 6th of March, we will get introduced to another great person. Uh, C. Miller Fisher and Professor Louis Kaplan will talk about C. Miller Fisher on 6th of March, same time. So, thank you very much. Thank you all. And uh, we just one, just a short interjection, Dr. Meshram. We all need to congratulate Dr. Shakir. He's uh, wonderful award, and we are absolutely thrilled. Uh, Congratulations, Dr. Congratulations. From the entire Indian community. Thank you. I mentioned that in the intro. <laughs> right. Sorry. Thank sorry. You. Thank I you missed. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gagandeep. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent Thank you all very much indeed. And very Thank good to you. And Thank you for the superb organization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.